Yeah, my name is uh, Bill Kinahan. Um, as the slide here says, I'm with a company called Scale. And um, let's see, um, Bubba Davis, James Bubba Davis uh, is on the call as well. Um, between the two of us, we um, run the uh, data interoperability uh, working group as part of the uh, phase consortium. Um, anyway, today I'm going to go through a bit of an overview on um, what data architecture is all about. So let's see, let's just dive right in. Now, uh, the first number of slides here, let's see here. Sorry, just figuring out how to use the computer. The first group of slides here, um, we're probably covered in a lot more depth in the, um, the business working group um, and technical working group overview. So I'm going to go through these um, really quickly. Um, I think most of the folks on the call, you know, attended those. And if you didn't, um, as Reggie mentioned, they're recorded and online and available to go back and, and look at for uh, for better reference. But anyway, you know, real quick, you know, why, you know, why is there a face initiative? I mean, basically, um, you know, the, the systems as they've been built today, you know, don't really allow for reuse, you know, across the different platforms. Each one's a unique solution. And, um, you know, that structure really doesn't uh, doesn't support uh, currently um, doing something better than that. So we've, we've got to find a, a better way to um, uh, make it so that we can develop pieces once and reuse them, you know, over and over again. Okay. So, you know, this is sort of borne out by, you know, the trends you've seen. I'm sure folks have seen this kind of chart uh, over the years, you know, as the complexity of the platform goes up, you know, the cost and the time, you know, are starting to really go up exponentially and we need to, you know, we, we can't survive um, you know, that kind of trajectory anymore, and we've got to make a, a step function change. So the idea is, you know, by coming up with a new way of doing this where we can reuse, and it's not a reinvent every time we need to um, create something, you know, hopefully we can have this kind of positive effect, you know, on future aircraft where we bring the cost down uh, substantially. Okay, um, why a consortium? Well, you know, you know, the idea here is to, I'm sorry, is there a question? Okay, just a reminder, if you're not, uh, you know, if you're not asking a question, please go on mute um, so that uh, um, we don't have background noise. Anyway. Yeah, um, excuse me, Bill, one, excuse me for interrupting. Yes. Um, I see that there's a couple of callers there that um, I, I need you to identify yourselves. I see a 6172 and a 9082 numbers. Because otherwise, um, if you can't identify yourself, unfortunately, I would have to kind of kick you off. The 908 number is in the right corner. Two? Yes, 617 is Draper. Is Draper? Draper, yeah. Can you put that, can you put those in the chat room for me, please? Okay, thank you for identifying. Sorry, Bill. That's not a problem. Um, so anyway, you know, why a consortium? You know, I think the idea here is to get the industry and government and academia all involved and come up with a common solution. Uh, the consensus-based approach, you know, is more likely to be uh, more widely accepted than than a government-mandated or vendor-specific approach that's put forward. So, um, you know, by having the consortium, you know, there's an open discussion process, open decision process. Um, what happens? Uh, everybody's interests are balanced to the extent that they can be. There's a there's um, you know process to follow. There's an appeals process. It's all based on consensus. Um, and again, you know, the idea is it's not a um, a solution that's dominated by one particular you know organization or interest. I mean, um, anyway, that's the you know the idea behind uh, forming a consensus to or a consortium to do this. Um, quick idea, quick overview of the organization. All right, there's a steering committee uh, at the head, okay, which um, uh, ties into an advisory board for um, making sure that we're we're on board with industry trends and we're keeping our eyes uh, open on um, things that we need to to focus on. Underneath the steering committee, we're divided up into um, three main working groups. There's a business working group. All right, uh, there's a technical working group and um, the group that's talking right now, the domain interoperability working group. 
Okay. There's also an enterprise architecture uh, standing committee um, that uh, does some things like make sure, making sure we have alignment with other, uh, other standards bodies, um, looks at the, the larger integration problem and so forth. And so we'll look a little bit more about the domain interoperability working group uh, in later charts. And I think we've um, covered the business working group and technical working groups in, uh, in other sessions. Um, hey, Reggie, I'm not looking at the chat. So if questions come in, maybe you can, um, can bump me and let me know that there's a question. Uh, sure. Okay, sure. Thank, thanks. Or, you know, if, if folks just wanna speak up and ask as well. Um, you know, the consortium is a pretty, there's a pretty um, broad uh, participation across uh, across industry, government, um, you see sponsor level organizations. Um, we've got uh, sponsors from from all the different service branches, um, you know, and we've also got uh, some key players in industry: Boeing, uh, Collins, Lockheed, Raytheon. Uh, again, a, a number of um, you know principal level organizations all listed here. I'm not sure what the total organization count up of it count is uh, currently, but as you can see, there's, there's a, uh, the list is pretty much a who's who of folks that are doing things in the, um, uh, the airborne avionics uh, domains. Okay. Um, the uh, elected, you know, officers today, uh, committee, um, chair and, and vice chair, you have Joe Carter from Army and, and Fred uh, Miramar, Imar Descharm from IBM. Uh, business Working Group, uh, James Doty from uh, L3 Harris, and Brendan O'Donnell from PEO Aviation. Uh, technical work, Working Group uh, Chair and Vice Chair are Chris Crook, Chris Crook from Army uh, PEO uh, Aviation, and uh, Ben Brosgill from uh, Adacor. And for the uh, Domain Interoperability Working Group, or the DIOG, you've got um, Bubba Davis and myself, Bill Kinahan. Um, again, you know, I think, you know, a lot of presentations of yesterday, you know, covered this. So again, I'm not going to get into it much detail other than that. You know, the idea on the right hand side is, you know, we're, we're trying to open up the whole platform. Okay. The applications, the middleware, the operating system, um, and, uh, and the hardware side as well. Although face, I will say does not address hardware, but, um, you know, where the face is hardware agnostic, you can, you know, be on top of. Uh, you know, practically any any different platform that support, supports you know one of the uh, one of the operating systems that's uh, demonstrated to be phase conforming. Um, <clears throat> so you know, again, I think you've seen this chart before, but you know what makes this all work pretty well is you know all these different technologies for how to do light bulbs. Um, you know, have a common interface. So we look at you know how that applies to you know what we're doing in software. Um, you know, if we have a uh, specific, you know, kind of functionality um, and we, we find a way to normalize the interfaces, then, you know, we've got some portability and adaptability, you know, on top of and, and below that interface. Um, you know, this sort of goes back to that first chart is, you know, why are we doing this? You know, when you look at, um, legacy platforms, you know, each one of them sort of a one off. So if I want to integrate this kind of equipment onto these platforms, I've got, you know, four separate integration efforts, the same thing for these, the same thing for these. And it's not just the integration efforts, but, you know, by and large with these having, you know, a different approach to bringing these kinds of capabilities on, um, the functionality that controls this equipment or this equipment or this equipment typically is unique to the solution that's been integrated into here already. So if I'm talking to some NAV device, you know, ABC, you know, ABC vendors, EGI, and I want to put that on the Chinook, you know, that company has, you know, developed their own way of, you know, building that piece of software. Likewise, you know, this company has, you know, built, built it their own way. And, you know, FACE is trying to uh, promote a way, a way that we can actually develop these components, you know, one time, these, one, these software components one time and integrate them into the different platforms individually. And, you know, by having the, the layered approach here, um, you know, 
segmenting your your device I/O, um, your your platform pieces that talk to those devices, and the communication between the platform pieces and and uh, the portable components and within these segments by uh, by normalizing that we've got uh, uh, the ability to actually move the components from platform to platform so we don't have to remake these you know every time we want to put it on a new platform it's just an integration effort at that point okay um yeah there's a number of uh certified components uh, that are becoming available as you know there's a uh, the face um, product registry hopefully you heard about that yesterday um and this uh, slide gives you a bit of a, a snapshot into you know who has components in there the set of components um in that library i believe there's portable components in there there's uh, operating system uh, components in there there's transport service implementations and even some some data model implementations um, so you know the uh, the list of things is growing and you know is projected to to continue to grow as as more capability is developed all right <clears throat> and uh this is a bit of a you know recap you know on on some of the slides we recap on the recap um you know, again, you know, why are we doing this? Is to, to open everything up um, so that we have, you know, more competition and more flexibility, all right? Um, you know, define, you know, create well-defined interfaces uh, so that we can, um, you know, define a marketplace uh, for, the, for the pieces of software. Benefits-wise, from the government's perspective, you know, it's more flexibility and aligns to, you know, what the government is trying to accomplish. And from industry's perspective, well, number one, they're, they're meeting their customers' requirements, but then there's new opportunities for business. The barrier to entry for selling, for defining certain components has come down some, so you can have components from a broader group of folks. And then at the same time, you know, it should, um, you know, improve productivity uh, through the, the open architectures and the reuse and modeling and so forth. Uh, maturity and adoption, you know, we're to, we just released uh, version 3.1 of the phase technical standard. Um, you know, it's a, it's a small delta on top of 3.0, which uh, had major improvements over the phase 2.1 version. But uh, again, we're at, uh, you know, we're at 3.1, it's published now, and <clears throat> um, there is a conformance um, process in place. You know, uh, as mentioned earlier, there's a number of things in the registry. I think we said 23 on the prior chart and 22 here, so we'll have to check that. But um, again, the you know, the fact that we've got that many things in the registry um, does speak to number one, the maturity of the standard, and number two, um, the maturity of the conformance process. Okay. So that's my, you know, blazing fast pass through the overview that, um, again, hopefully, you know, most folks uh, saw that yesterday. If you aren't as familiar, there's uh, there's presentations from the business working group and the, and the technical working group that probably go into a lot more detail than I did. So anyway, now we're on to the uh, domain interoperability working group, which is um, the one that, uh, that Bubba and I, um, Share chairing roles on. So there's the domain interoperability, interoperability working group. Um, we've got that divided into uh, three subcommittees. All right, the first one is what we call our language subcommittee. All right, that's run by uh, Stu, Fer Stu Ferking from CCD AVMIC and uh, Ryan Brooks from Boeing. The language subcommittee is um, in charge of coming up with the um, uh, the meta modeling concepts that form the basis of data modeling for face. All right. Um, there's the meta model. There's all the different uh, rules on model construction and those kinds of things. That's all uh, under the auspices of our language subcommittee. Uh, we've got a another subcommittee called the shared data model subcommittee. All right. That's uh, right now led by Chris Alport and. Um, uh, we're still searching for uh, for the right uh, co-lead um, to work with Chris. 
Not that Chris is difficult to work with, and we just can't find the right lead. <laughs> um, anyway, we'll talk a little bit more about the shared data model, but real, you know, brief description is it's a, uh, a, a set of shared definitions that um, are standardized by face or expected to be used um, by uh, by every data model that that folks produce. Okay. Um, the shared data model subcommittee is responsible for um, evaluating change proposals and coming up with recommendations for the shared data model uh, change control board. And then finally, we've got our um, guidance subcommittee led by Leanne May uh, from Collins Aerospace and Sean Mulholland from Tucson Embedded Systems. Uh, this subcommittee is responsible for coming up with, as the name implies, guidance on how to how to do data modeling. Okay, um, they actually um, publish the uh, R volume, the data the data modeling volume of the reference implementation guide. And in addition to that, they you know attack um, you know various questions that come up about how to model certain things and produce white papers that are available on Plato. Um, that uh, folks can use to uh, to look at special topics that aren't covered by the rig. Okay, <clears throat> so now we we start actually talking a little bit about data model. I know you, there's a lot of excitement out there. So, but anyway, um, the um, you know, I like to start with this picture um, because you know I think. You know, there's a lot of folks on the on the call that uh, have probably a lot of background in in um, in software engineering, okay, and are used to uh, developing. You know, what I'll say are data types. Okay, they are description. They are you know uh, focused on data structure um, that is um, intended to be a an efficient both in terms of space and access way of structuring the storage of information, all right, for uh, for retrieval and use, okay, and make sure that we've, we've captured, you know, all the information, we can get at it quickly or quickly enough. We have ways to communicate it and share it and so forth. That's, you know, what I'll say data types are, okay? And I'd say a lot of folks, um, not everybody, but, you know, most, um, are starting over here. This is what we're used to for if you've done software for for years, okay? Data structures. Well, where we're going is over here, okay? And it's different. It's a um, it's a way of looking at the data in terms of relationships, okay? How does this thing, you know, relate to these other things? And you know, what are the properties of those things? And properties of those relationships, okay? It's it's actually quite a different way of looking at it. And it's, um, you know, what we found over the, over the years of doing this is that there's actually a pretty big paradigm shift to go from over here where you're thinking about how is data organized, you know, for, for software versus what is the meaning of the data, okay? So I'd say you know, most of us are over here. We may have a few that are over here, and then this is where we're gonna we're gonna try to go. And after I go through the presentation, you'll hopefully, you know, uh, understand a little bit better about you know what this destination is. Now, um, you know, as we go forward, you know, if you have any questions, um, you know, put them in the chat, and Reg will alert me. I'll make sure I address them in time. Um, so, anyway. I'm going to move to the next chart. So, you know, what are we trying to accomplish with data modeling? So, you know, I've got a bit of a <clears throat> a, uh, a rigorous definition here. All right. Um, I'm going to say describe the data going into or coming out of a software component in the context of the entities of concern to the software component to enable an integrator to combine software components to provide a bigger capability. So, you know, what does that mean in a little more, you know, easy to understand language, right? We're really just trying to describe what it is we want to communicate um, to and from our software. And we need to do that well enough so that everybody understands what we mean so it's easier to put the parts together, really. So that's what, that's what we're trying to accomplish. Now to do so, 
That means we need to capture the, the semantics of the data exchange in a rigorous machine processable format. Okay. In other words, you know, we want to have a we want to have a model that we can do something with. Okay. And you know, we need it to be, you know, fairly, you know, fairly formal in the way we describe things. Okay. And again, I'll I'm gonna get into you know, maybe my next chart of the chart after we're gonna we're gonna show you what a little bit of this looks like. It's probably kind of fuzzy right now. Um, and the last thing on this chart here that's important to understand is the, the data model mechanisms that we've built into the, the data modeling language within FACE, you know, are, are domain independent. There's nothing FACE specific about them, right? You can, you can describe uh, avionics type things, things for navigation, communication, but, but beyond that, you could theoretically describe, you know, anything. In our next example, we get into, you know, describing aspects of a university. Okay, that has nothing to do with avionics and and so forth. But uh, the data modeling language is is quite, you know, quite adept at being able to to describe those. Okay, this is not for weapon system or for aircraft or tactical or navigation or any of those specific things. It's it's pretty wide open. We just happen to use it for those kinds of things. A lot of the components. All righty. Um, <clears throat> where does data modeling fit? Um, let's see. Hopefully, you've seen this chart uh, over the last uh, last day. Um, we've got the different face uh, segments here. So these green lines here, okay, you know, represent the the uh, usage of you know the platform specific services segment components down in here and the portable component component segments. Well, anytime we want to communicate between any of these components, either within a segment or between segments, okay, we have to use the face transport services segment to do that. Okay, we can't communicate directly between these guys here or from this guy to this guy, you know, without going through transport services. And where the data model fits in is for all these interfaces here that use the transport services, any usage of that has to be data modeled. Okay, we need to describe the data that we're going to communicate either you know into or out of our components. Okay, and then transport services, um, you know, when when configured by the integrator, you know, will match up the interfaces between the source and the destination and provide any kind of translation and and uh, other kinds of functionality, you know, that uh, allow the interfaces to be connected to one another. Okay. So, um, let's start looking at an example of, you know, what a what a data model look, might look like. So, I'm going to assume that most folks on the call, you know, have an understanding of what uh, what your basic university uh, uh, idea is. So what we've done here is we've got a you know really small you know set of concepts that we're going to use to to show um, how this relates to some of the data model terminology. Now for for this particular picture, um, I've got uh, see, well look, I've got two different kinds of blue boxes on there. I guess they're not technically boxes, but I've got this this kind here with is a you know, rectangle with the rounded corners, and then I've got hexagons. Now, uh, important to mention at this point that face doesn't really have a diagramming notation. Okay, our meta modeling language, you know, is is um, you know strictly you know textual. Okay, um, but uh, but often it's convenient to be able to draw some pictures, right, to describe things. So. Um, we've sort of invented our own notation just you know, informally, but this is not mandated by the standard. You can uh, use other forms. I know there's UML profiles that have been used to draw, you know, to help model things in FACE. But again, I want to point out that FACE does not have a diagramming notation um, uh, as part of the standard. But, you know, this is what we're going to use for, for, for this lesson here. So anyway, I've got um, two kinds of things. I've got entities, and I've got an I've got associations. Now, entities are 
are, yeah, as you would you know, kind of guess, they're, they're things, all right, that we, might, uh, we t might talk about. When I mentioned entities of concern uh, earlier, and then, you know, these are the kinds of ideas that I'm talking about. Now, associations establish relationships between entities. Okay, so they sort of tie them together and provide some kind of meaning and a relationship between the two. Now, let's, you know, let's use those definitions to look at this picture a little bit more. So, I've got my two entities. I've got a universe. Oops. If I click, it changes the chart on me. So, uh, I've got a university. Okay, here. Now, let's think about, you know, what are some, you know, some attributes of a university? Um, it's a good time to bring up, you know, these these things here. They're called attributes or properties. Um, they are the, you know, the characteristics um, of entities. And you notice here that associations also can have their own characteristics. So that's sort of a universal thing. Um, but if I look at a university, some of the characteristics that it has that I might be interested in are you know, the ID of the university, the name of the university, um, the location of it. Okay. You know, so those are some common things that we would attribute to a university. There's a long, I'm sure there's a long list of other things, but um, we only model what we need to model, right? And for this point and purpose, you know, I don't, we don't need to model much beyond what we have here. Now, if I look at a person, um, you know, I've modeled one characteristic of person, right? And that's, uh, that's ID. Now, it turns out there's a face rule that says, you know, that says every entity or association needs to have an ID characteristic. That's the one they need to have. And everything else beyond that is is optional. Okay, persons do have many more characteristics, and I'm actually building something you know more real and practical. I have a bunch more stuff in there, but for this example, you know, ID is is fine. Okay, now um, where it gets a little more interesting, okay, is when I start looking at uh, associations. So. You know, let's look at this one here, enrollment. Okay, well, that's that's a relationship we've defined between a university and a person. And hopefully this makes sense to everybody. People are enrolled in universities, right? So each enrollment relationship might have some characteristics of its own, all right? Um, got a, uh, um, you know, a date of the enrollment, you know, an ID of the enrollment. Remember I said each one of these have to have IDs. Um, but, you know, this enrollment has, you know, these, these characteristics, all right? And then when we follow these lines over here, okay, you see I've got some labels on them that describe the, um, what I'll call the cardinalities, you know, of that part of the relationship. So if we follow this line over here, okay, we see that the university, and this will feel kind of familiar to all you folks that know UML, um, has a, um, it's, its participation in this relationship here has the role name of university, right? And each enrollment, you know, has one university that's participating. That's that one dot dot one. Okay, and if we follow it over this way, right, the person is playing the role of student in this participation, okay, in each enrollment relationship as one student. So essentially an enrollment is a relationship between one university and one student. Okay. Bill, yep. I have a question for you. Sure. Okay. Um it's from Tony. Um and would like to know why didn't we do an aircraft related example? Um well I've got one a little 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 later on uh that shows something more uh, not necessarily aircraft um but um you know, something tactical. Um, so, you know, we do touch on that a little bit, um, but the main reason is um, this is something that didn't really require much in the way of domain knowledge. You know, I figure most of the folks that are gonna hear this are familiar with this. Um, and, you know, for the, for the business folks that might be listening in that don't know anything about, you know, common operating pictures and those kinds of things, they could, you know, they could relate to this a little bit better. So, um, and then, you know, one other thing is that um, I think it speaks to the, I'll say the universality, you know, of what you can do with the data, with data modeling. So we try to touch on the aircraft stuff, but, you know, this I felt was, um, 
just a little more, you know, widely understood than some things from an from an aircraft domain. We, we've also received some comments in the past with one of our learning examples we used as we developed the phase 3.0 data architecture and language and that some of the decisions we made just for documenting and exploring what were uh, what features were available and how they were implemented in the language didn't line up 100 percent with army doctrine and so there ended up being confusion and discussion over what amounts to a sample example model and army doctrine and we, we didn't want to get into those kind of uh, discussions Yeah, there's, there's less difference of opinion here on this. <laughs> so hopefully that answers your question, Tony. Um, we'll try to touch on that. And again, you know, if you have more specific questions or you want to, you know, you, you, something more aircraft specific um, of help, we can see if we can wrap back around to that at the end. So let's see. Um, so I addressed, you know, these labels here, but, you know, I didn't really speak to these. Okay. And these are the source end of the participation. And, you know, what they're trying to do is, is establish some rules on, you know, numbers of enrollments, for instance, okay? So when I put a zero to star on this end here, basically it says that, hey, a university can participate in zero to many enrollment relationships, okay? And a person, Okay, um, well, I mean, the way we've set it up here, a person can participate in zero to many enrollment relationships too. So what does this all mean? Well, a university can have many people enrolled in it or many students enrolled in it. And a person can, can be part of enrollment relationships with multiple universities. In other words, you know, you could be going to, you know, Cornell and RPI. Right, and your local community college, if you want. Right, there's no we haven't put a bounds on that when we've described it here. Okay, including zero. Maybe he's not going to school anywhere. Okay, you know, um, like many of us, we've graduated and we're we're just working now. <laughs> so, anyway, um, you know, if we look here, we've just de described another relationship. Um, that is uh, an employment relationship. Now, if I look at this one here, it says, well, an employment relationship is between one university and one person. Okay. That employment relationship, you know, has, um, you know, has a date, maybe an ID. So you can think of this as like your, you know, employee ID. Up here, this is your student ID, right? Um, but uh, again, like an employment relationship between a university and a person, in this case, the person is a professor, okay, we've, you know, so we've developed this generic idea of a person, okay, and, you know, in some cases, they're filling the role of student, in some cases, they're filling the role of a professor. And then, the, you know, one, one tip I'd give you, you know, in doing data modeling, think about, you know, an entity, you know, when you're, when you're contemplating and creating an entity, think about, you know, its usage and, you know, when you're when you're coming up with that idea, you know, for that entity, you know, can it be used in more than one, um, you know, kind of relationship? So I'll be honest, when I when I first started this example, well, I had a person entity, I'm sorry, a, a student entity, and a and a professor entity, right? And you know, in hindsight, that doesn't you know, that's not necessarily the best thing, but that's what fell out at first. But when I started exploring you know, some of the relationships, I said, well, what if, a, you know, the way I've done this, a student can't also be a teacher and a professor, right? But I know that, you know, from, from experience and some of some of Dr. Bubba's, you know, personal experience, you know, he's been both, I think even for the same class, <laughs> a student and a teacher in the same class. But anyway, um, so, you know, when you're thinking about this, you know, think about what you've defined and how broadly it can be used. So here I took my student entity and my, my teacher entity and I generalized them to be person and just put them into different relationships um, and let the relationships define, you know, what role they are playing there. Okay. 
Um, looking at this employment relationship just a little bit further, you know, so again, it's between one university and one professor, right? But a university can participate in zero to many employment relationships, okay? It can have, you know, uh, any number of employees, theoretically. Okay, zero isn't very much of a university, but, but uh, you know, we saw no reason to limit it here. And likewise, a person, you know, can participate in uh, zero to many employment relationships with a university. So maybe it doesn't work for a school at all. Okay, um, and then many of the students aren't going to, you know, participate in that kind of relationship. The person might teach at multiple schools. You know, you might teach at, you know, a couple of different local universities or whatever. Um, so, you know, hopefully you guys are getting the idea uh, on that. Um, let's see, uh, one thing, one question that's often asked when I'm presenting this is um, that an employment relationship has to between, be between a person and a, a school, but what if that person wants to work somewhere else, <laughs> right? That's not a school. So we didn't, we didn't tackle that in our example. Um, so we've, you know, we can sort of shape our, our whole world here and that's what, that's what we've done. We've limited to that, but. Um, but yeah, in, in real life, you'd probably need to look at, um, you know, employment relationship, you know, being a little more open-ended on the, uh, on the other end. Um, I do want to come back to, you know, these characteristics here, you know, um, you know, these IDs again, might be different depending on the different relationships. Your student ID might not be your, your employee, your faculty ID. Right, so they're they're unique to the different they uh, they're unique to the different uh, relationships here. So uh, I'm going to go into the next chart. Is there any more questions that have come up, Reggie? Because this is about the time we usually start getting some. Nothing yet. No. Okay. Was well, it... don't be bashful, folks. <laughs> yeah, just put it in the chat window, and I'll relay that to uh, Bill. We hardly we hardly ever make fun of anybody for a question. Anyway, so, you know, trying to think about this a little more broadly. Now, I didn't put the numbers in here and the, the different labels, but, you know, if we, if we were to take what we looked at here and expand a little bit further and look at some of the um, other ideas and concepts, okay, uh, in our university example. So we've got, you know, our, our, our university here again, but, you know, what do you, if we were to, you know, play a little bit of, you know, I'll say buzzword bingo with, uh, with a university, what are some of the, the things we think of? Well, we think of the university and the courses and the classes and the classrooms and, you know, all those kinds of things. So they all show up on this picture. All right. So I've got my university and, you know, there's an idea of a course, but you know, what is the course, you know, relationship to the university? Well, the university offers the course. Okay. And courses, you know, um, have IDs, right? Maybe, you know, going back to, you know, to when I was in school, I had, you know, CSC 221, right? Introduction to Pascal. <laughs> um, but that was the ID of the class, right? And, you know, it, was, it had a duration or a number of credit hours or whatever, you know, associated with it. Okay, and that's the course. So I looked up the course catalog, there it was. Well, every semester when you had to sign up for things, you know, it wasn't just one of these. There was, you know, several different versions of the class that could be offered. And those are, you know, a class is really an instance of a course. So I might have, you know, section one, section two, three, and so on. Okay. So, you know, the university offers a course in each semester. There's certain, you know, uh, classes, which are instances of those courses. Is there a question? Hey, Bill, I, yeah, we have one um, from Travis and asking, um, and I think, I think he's talking about slide 18, um, but if he wanted to add a person who is an assistant or a janitor or whatever. Hey, Reggie, your audio wasn't coming through too good for me. Can you repeat that? Oh, wait a minute. It said, what if, what if you wanted to add a person who is an assistant or a janitor or whatever? That's um, terrible. What, what's going on? Yeah, so let's see here. Um, so, you know, I could come back here if I wanted to deal with all persons um, employed by the university. 
you know, I could probably, um, you know, change this relationship here to be the name here to be employee. Okay. Right now, it's sort of specific that, you know, this relationship deals with professors. Okay. And if I wanted to generalize it, you know, I could change the name of this to be employee, and that would deal with all employees of the university. Now, if I wanted to, you know, single out uh, teaching, you know, I might have another relationship here called teaching, right? Um, that went between a university and a person, and you know, the the person on the other end, you know, was labeled teacher, professor, or whatever. And I could sort of single out that specialized kind of relationship, um, different from a, a generic employee relationship. Hopefully, I answered your question, Travis. You know, yeah, that'll do. Zone. Thanks, appreciate it. Okay. You know, it's probably a good time to point out that I mean, you're going to model based on you know what you need to describe the concepts for, for what you're building. Okay. So, um, you know, you, you've heard the statement, you know, all models are wrong, but some of them are useful. I mean, that's sort of the same idea here, right? We're describing things and relationships between those things, and we're only describing the stuff that's important to us, all right? We haven't captured, you know, other characteristics of university. We haven't captured other relationships between universities and persons um, and so forth, because, you know, as we've narrowly defined the problem here, you know, that's not important. Okay, so, um, you know, when you go through this, you'll, you'll learn as you go what, you know, what just enough, you know, just the right amount of modeling is. And, it, and it's a bit of a, you know, uh, an iterative process. I will say that, you know, as you go through this, you'll, um, you know, d don't do it in ink <laughs> or, do it, or do it on a whiteboard so you can easily release, erase it because, you know, you're going to write some things down and you're going to change your mind and, and new, uh, new realizations are going to pop into your head and you're going to, you're going to fix some things um, so that it, uh, it captures what you need to. Yeah, you know, Bubba and I did this example. Um, Oh, I don't know, more than a year ago now. And I think, you know, every time we do this overview, somebody points out, you know, something that we didn't think of or some, you know, some limitation of the model. Um, and we just say, well, we meant it that way. <laughs> but but they're you know, they're they're good points really. And you know, you'll you'll go through that process when you do data modeling yourself. Uh, there's, you know, I'd like to say it's exact and you know when you're done and you know you've got it right. And, you know, unfortunately, um, part of that, part of that path from going from data structures to, you know, data modeling, um, you know, part of that, uh, that shift in paradigm, um, you know, is, is this activity where, you know, you're, you're not sure and you're, you're trying to find your way. Um, anyway, coming back here, you know, we, we talked about hey, courses. Bill, can I tests. ask you a follow-up question? Sure. Um, so you can stay on this slide, it's fine. Um, just wanted to follow up on your comment about uh, this level of uncertainty. Um, in your experience or, or other modelers that you're aware of, um, there's going to be a point, right, where you're identifying gaps in your model. and uh -huh. um, and I'm, I'm kind of wondering how detrimental said gaps could be to the software development process and life cycle. Because sometimes I, I'm guessing that, well, you know, we've done enough modeling and we're gonna call it good and we'll, we'll take care of the rest of it in requirements or rationale or derived requirements or, or what have you and, and get going with the rest of it. Um, and so I guess I'm just saying, uh, is there ever a point in, in which the gaps that you may or may not know about in your model are detrimental to the um, software development process? Yeah, I mean, you know, it's hard to answer because, you know, all the different scenarios are different and it depends on how, to what extent you're exploiting the model. Um, if there are gaps uh, where you've missed something, where there's data you need to address, either in your requirements or in communication between components, 
you know, um, you know, you're going to have to do the refactoring of the model and, you know, the artifacts downstream because, you know, you've decided that's data you need to communicate about. All right. Um, but, you know, ultimately, um, as we'll talk about a little in a little bit, this model here, okay, um, it helps you define the concepts, but it's, um, it forms a basis for the data that you use to compose your messages, your data structures that the software uses. Okay, so ultimately there's data structures in the, you know, at some point, um, but the, the modeling language actually has a, a natural way of sort of decoupling this conceptual view from you know the data structures that end up popping out and you're using in your code. So um, by using you know that mechanism, the the view mechanism, which we'll talk about in a little bit, um, you might be able to change this model that we're seeing on the screen here now, but not change any of those those views because um, the data you've put into them, you know, um, is already in the model. It may have moved around, and you're going to relink those pieces together. But the data structure didn't change, and therefore your software doesn't necessarily have to change either. Okay, okay thanks. No problem. And, and we're going to touch on views in a little bit. Um, so let's see here. You know, continuing through here, you know, you've got you know persons, all right, people. Okay, and um, well, they're going to enroll in a certain class, not just the university, but they're going to enroll in a certain class. All right. And you've got another person that's teaching the class, all right? Looking here, you know, where are you going to hold the class? Well, you know, the university has rooms, okay? Some of them, you know, are classrooms, okay? Not all of them. Like, you know, the gymnasium might not be, you know, maybe a room at the, the university, but, you know, isn't necessarily a classroom. Um, I guess for phys ed it could be, but, um, but anyway, you get the point. And then... You know, there's a room allocation between a class and a classroom, okay? And um, if we chase that all the way through here, we can get to, you know, what the room is. Now, one interesting thing on this chart, I see this association relates an entity to another association, okay? And that's, you know, perfectly allowable in the face modeling language. As a matter of fact, if you were to look at the underlying meta model, you know, an association is just a form of entity that allows you to connect other entities together, but it itself is an entity. So you can you can do some some stuff like this to really capture um, uh, the relationships. Uh, let's see. I saw a quick thing pop up. Looks like Ben might have a question or a comment. Yeah, it's yeah. Uh, yeah, so oh, you'll probably yeah. cover this. But what about the types of the attributes? For example, duration could be in minutes or in hours, and uh -huh. a fraction of an hour, etc. So I know you're going to get to yeah. it, but you know, I'll mention it here. <laughs> no, that's that's fine. That's, that's you're playing a good straight man. Um, you'll notice, you know, what we've done here describing these concepts. We haven't addressed any of that. We haven't said what the ideas look like, or or you know what the location of a room or university is, or the duration of a class. How we're doing that in minutes or or, or, you know, fortnights or whatever, right? Um, conceptually, we don't have to. We all sort of understand, you know, the position or the, the position, <laughs> the concept of a position, regardless of how we're gonna, gonna measure it, right? So conceptually speaking, you know, we describe it this way. And then you're right, Ben, we, uh, we do have another layer of this that goes through and says, okay, that position, you know, I'm gonna describe it um, this way, okay? And then I'm also, when I, when I actually, represent it in real physical data types in my programming language, it's going to take on this shape. Okay, and we do we do get to that in other layers of the model, and I believe my next chart is going to start to hint at some of that. So, um, let's see, I think I'm done with this chart unless there was more questions on it. So, what we've been looking at to this point is what we're going to, you know, we'll call our conceptual data model. It defines the concepts and some of the, you know, properties of all the entities and relationships. But again, as Ben pointed out, I haven't talked at all about specifics on on what uh, some of these next things mean. So that's where you know, faith actually has you know, multiple multiple levels to it. Okay, so we've looked at you know the conceptual data model. All right, um, that's where we spend our time right now. And that's, 
you know, to me, you know, that's the most head scratching part of the whole thing, right? That's, you know, where you're really trying to um, tease the ideas apart and figure out what are the right entities and what's an association between them and where does, you know, XYZ property live? Is it part of an entity? Is it part of an association? You know, those kinds of things, all right? After that, in my opinion, it gets easier because now it's just, you're just making some some refining choices. So, you know, we've talked about our conceptual data model and our logical data model. Actually, let me come back here and use one specific term that might help. In our conceptual data model, we've talked about our entities and their observable characteristics. Okay, that, that word observable is important. They're the things that, you know, we can, we can see, uh, we can measure, okay? At the logical level now, all right, for those entities and associations we've defined, we make some choices about how we're going to measure those observable characteristics. So that, you know, that position, you know, for the university, um, you know, might be, uh, you know, a lat long that I've described in, you know, um, degrees from for, for the latitude and longitude. Okay, or I could do something you know crazy like use Earth centered Earth fixed coordinates where it's an XYZ kind of system based on the, the center of the Earth, or you know I can use a street address. Okay, all of those are um, good ways to describe a position, right? That at the logical level we make a choice on which ones, which one we're going to use. Okay, and matter of fact, I can even I can even make multiple choices. I'm going to be able to get at its lat long position and its street address position. Okay. Um, so at the logical level, it's pretty much the same thing as we've done here, but we make some choices on how we're going to measure those observable characteristics. Okay, and, and I'll emphasize that we can, you know, we can perhaps do that more than one way. Okay, if it's if it's useful to you in your domain to do that. Now, the platform level, well, again, we're just making some, some choices, all right? If I have decided I wanna use lat long to measure the position of my university, well, at the platform level, I might say that, well, you know, I'm gonna use double precision for latitude and longitude to be able to you know, represent that position with the accuracy I need. Or, you know, university, I, I, you know, uh, a float is fine, you know, gets me close enough. Okay. Or for my, you know, my street address uh, version of um, the position of the university, maybe I'm going to use a text string. Okay? But those kind of choices are made here at the platform level. So just going through it again, you know, here we define basic concepts and, and observable properties of things. Here, how are we going to measure those properties using what kind of measurement system and what kind of units and frames of reference and all kinds of things, right? And then here, what is the actual, you know, type, data type that I'm going to use look like? Okay, so for my, my lat long, I might use, you know, it's going to be a struct of doubles, you know, something like that. Okay, for my ID, it might be, you know, a 64-bit, you know, integer, 128-bit integer to hold a UUID, you know, something like that. All right, hopefully everybody is with me so far. Um, ben, did that um, help clarify things at all? Yeah, if it's one question, when you get to the platform view, you're talking about doubles and floats, but that's language independent, like, is it like an IDL, or you're looking at, uh, you know, C, D, C++, ADA? It's language independent, so it's all tied into uh, data types that uh, sort of map to, to IDL. Actually, okay. if you look at the meta modeling language, you know, it would be, you know, an IDL double, an IDL float, that kind of stuff. Okay. And then later on, there's a translation process, you know, into the underlying programming languages. Um, again, you know, we, you know, try to maintain as much independence as we can and who knows maybe in the future there'll be some other version maybe we'll do it in rust or go or something like that in the future right um and so we want to we want to maintain independence and just change the mapping so this part here okay um you know defines our our model um of the entities and relationships now something i haven't really talked about 
Um, there's this thing, this little box here called platform views. <clears throat> now, you know, a platform, a view in general is a certain way of looking at um, parts of the model. Okay, so if you're familiar with, you know, with databases, um, you know, I might have a bunch of tables in my database and I might create views you know, of those tables, which are really just, you know, select statements that I can can view, um, you know, as sort of another table, but that's all joined from different data in the model. Well, views, you know, in face are pretty much the same thing. It's a reach back in the entity model um, to the data you want to include, you know, in the view, okay? Um, and Matter of fact, it's such a you know strong analogy back to databases. The the, the textual language we've chosen um, to actually do that is um, is derived from uh, the SQL language um, that's used in many database systems. But um, these views here, you know, again, they describe back, they reach back into the into the entity model to say what data is in that view, and Views actually, you know, are the key thing to define, you know, payloads of, you know, messages that are going to be communicated, you know, between your units of portability. Um, views, I'm probably getting a little bit ahead of myself, but views at the platform level actually, you know, map down into real, you know, IDL language structure that can be translated into any of the programming languages. Um, back here are these other levels um you know we can't define that structure because we really haven't defined you know data types at that point but we can still you know call out uh certain data that we want to be in part of our view um, but this is you know the, the most common usage of view is in this level here is to define payloads uh, that go back and forth between your uops units of portability um let's see so these are the three levels of the model. And these next two, you know, this next one isn't a level, so to speak, but it's a it's a, a usage of the model. Okay, so here you're going to define, you know, your component uh, and the interfaces to that component. So components can be in the different, you know, segments, right? The portable component segment, the platform specific, specific services component. Um, you can even have, you know, transport service components, you know, that are defined here. Um, the idea is, you know, what you define here, it talks about, you know, the interfaces um, to that component in terms of the data model. And so um, if I, you know, if I have some data I want to communicate in my component, I'll define views for it here that describe what parts of the entity model are in that particular view and then i'll create a component here and i'll have um what's called a a connection on that component that refers back to that view saying hey this connection that i called abc is going to you know point back to this abc view type right and that way um we know all the ports you know the intos and out of if you will for my unit of portability and the data types that are communicated over them and by knowing that I've got reach back into you know all the different levels of the models. So I've got all the information I need. Uh, I saw there's another question that popped up. Let's see yeah, just to clarify some terminology, the use of platform here is in terms of embedded software platform versus an aircraft form slash design or platform. Correct. That is correct, Travis. Yes. That was from Travis. Yep. Yeah, actually, uh, I finally figured out to open the chat window myself so I can oh, <laughs> see okay. stuff pop up. <laughs> so um, I you know, just brought it over to another screen so it's not interfering with the presentation. But yeah, you're right. I mean, platform is sort of an overused term. I remember when I first joined the consortium, I was like, well, what do they mean platform here? And you know, I was scratching my head on it for a while. Yes, platform here means, you know, the computing platform, not the air vehicle platform. Okay. Um, let's see. So we talked a little bit about units of portability. I can, you know, define, you know, one or more of them and, you know, describe the, uh, the, the connections that go into or out of the, 
you know, the portability and I can map it back to views. So I've got data types and so forth. Now, having all of this, uh, I can then, I've got all, you know, assuming it's all, you know, passes the conformance test and it's all, you know, it compiles, if you will. <laughs> um, I can then use that to translate, you know, what I have in my model into real live code. Okay, so um, <clears throat> I can take everything here and, you know, I can generate, if I have the right tools, I can generate IDL. Uh, I can, you know, go directly to Ada or C++ or C or Java, right? Those, um, you know, all of those, you know, are um, the mappings, the language mappings are defined right in the face technical standard. Okay, including you know how how this map how the face model maps to IDL and how IDL maps to these other things. So it's all on the standard. Um, if you want to do something in XML, I mean I'll, I'll say that the face data model itself is stored in a form of XML. But if you want to have your own uh, special form of XML that you use to you know as part of your message definitions, you know you can you can you know with um, with your own tools, you know, process the face data model, the XML that it is, and translate it into whatever form of XML you need. Okay, so this is really just a subset. The nice idea here is that by having this in a model, in, in you know, what I earlier referred to as a machine processable form, um, you know, you can feed it into different tools and, um, and translate it into whatever you need. Yeah, whatever makes sense for you to, to get the most uh, to leverage it the most that you can. Okay. So I think I've about exhausted everything on this chart. Um, I don't see any new questions popping up, so I'm going to move ahead. I'm going to try to move ahead anyway. Okay. <clears throat> so, you know, we, we've talked a little bit about the model, the, the different levels of the model. I'm going to get into just a little bit more detail. Um, the uh, I've got an interesting dividing line here. Okay, things to the left are something that's called in something called the shared data model, and everything to the right is stuff that's added in uh, what we call a UOP supplied model um, or USM. Right. So I, I talked a little bit about the shared data model earlier. Uh, I said that it's it's um, part. It's, it's produced by the FACE Consortium. It's managed by the FACE Consortium, all right? It contains some common definitions that we want to make sure that, um, you know, that everybody uh, has access to and everybody uses consistently, okay? So again, things to the left are in that, um, in that shared data model and, you know, are the, are the, you know, the only ones that you're allowed to use of those kinds of things. Everything to the right, you can come up with whatever you like. So at the conceptual level, you know, there's these idea of observables. Okay, what are the kinds of observable properties that I can describe on things? So we saw a couple: position, ID, duration. You know, some other common ones. You know, temperatures and pressures, velocity, acceleration. You know, all all those kinds of things. They're all observable properties. Um, many of them are observable properties of physical things, but some of them, you know, are a little more, you know, abstract, like um, health status, all right? You know, that's a little more abstract or mode or those kinds of things. Now there's a, again, a, a fixed set of things in this observable list that's managed by the consortium, but, um, you know, that's been pretty stable for, for a couple of years now. There's not really much added to that. Uh, so we think, believe it's, you know, pretty, pretty comprehensive. Um, in the case that there's something missing from the shared data model, that you need, um, you know, the process is to, you know, fill out a, a change request with the FACE Consortium to, you know, um, request it to be added, all right, providing, you know, data, data or details on, you know, what, uh, what should be there and, and why you think it needs to be there and, uh, and how it works and so forth. And then the, uh, the shared data model subcommittee that I brought up earlier, we'll take a look at it and, you um, and sort of, you know, judge it against the things that are in there now. Is this consistent with where we want to go? Um, is this a duplicate of something else, just with a different name, you know, and so forth? But anyway, they'll do some analysis and maybe even have some back and forth with the submitter. 
um, and then come up with a recommendation that the shared data model CCB uses um, to vote on. Um, that CCB, in case you're interested, includes members from uh, Republic and myself from the Diog are on it, um, Chris Crook and, um, and Ben are on it from the TWG, as well as uh, Stephanie Burns and uh, Stephen Price from the Transport Services Group. Because remember, you know, we, we need transport services to communicate um, you know, anything using the data model. So anyway, at CCB, you know, we'll, uh, we'll then, you know, look at that recommendation and, you know, go in or out. Okay. Um, but you can't just invent your own because if you try, you'll fail conformance if it's not in the shared data model. So anyway, we've got observable properties here and um, those are things in the shared data model. The other things at the conceptual level are entities and associations. So we, we showed you those. Okay. Now, not everything in our meta model is on this list. I'm, I'm trying to, you know, keep it, um, you know, meaningful for everybody. So there's some other little things behind the scenes, but these are the main things, right? Now at the logical level, okay, well, we, we want to talk about how we measure observables. Okay, so we've got, um, let's see here, we've got uh, measurement systems and, you know, to have a measurement system, actually you need some basic, you know, coordinate system kinds of concepts first, and then you can create measurement systems and measurement systems are based on, you know, certain landmarks with reference points that fill in. So, if, you know, for instance, if I want to do, you know, earth centered, earth fixed, I might have a landmark of the center of the earth and its reference point is zero, zero, zero. And then I've got a couple other reference points that you use to, to center the system, you know, in a, in a 3D space. And that's, you know, all defined at this level. We also have units. Okay. Um, we've got a really comprehensive set of units in there. Um, again, derived from about every source of units that we, we could find. Uh, this has been fairly stable as well. It's rare that something new gets added, um, but uh, there's a long list of units uh, out there. Uh, value types. Um, again, this list is pretty small. It's been, you know, stable pretty much since day one. Uh, we're talking about like real numbers, integer numbers, um, you know, enumeration, you know, uh, kinds of things, all right, or in value types. A new one in phase 3 is this standards-based measurement system. So sometimes uh, a standard exists um, that we want to use, that we want to point to instead of having to do it all in detail. Like, uh, I think, you know, the first one that went in there, um, correct me if I'm wrong, Bubba, was um, MGRS, Military Grid Reference System. All right, so that's a fairly, you know, complicated way to describe a location. And there's an existing standard out there for it. So rather than trying to you know, work it into a set of axes and all those kinds of things, this just points at that, you know, standard by name. Okay, and allows you then to say, hey, I'm measuring this position using MGRS. Okay. Um, now, these are the things that are in the shared data model. I mean, you've got measurement systems and coordinate systems. Now, the actual measurements themselves, you know, you're free to define. So you may point back to saying, hey, I'm using a WGS84 measurement system, which by default has units of meters, but, you know, I'm going to create my own measurement based on WGS84 that uses you know, inches, right? Some ridiculous thing, okay? Or I've got a temperature-based measurement system over here that, you know, by default, you know, uses, uh, you know, Celsius, but, you know, I need to do something in Kelvin or Fahrenheit or whatever, okay? So you're going to define your own measurements that are based on things that are going to use these over here. And the other thing that's still at this level here are your entities and associations because they're needed here to to be able to provide a trace back to to what you're refining. So my university here at the logical level would would uh, would um, realize back to the one at the conceptual level. Same thing for associations. At the platform level, okay, um, you've got your entities and associations again because now you're filling in the types for them. Okay. Um, but, uh, but you're going to define your own IDL types. So for my you know, earth centered earth fixed measurement system in inches here, you know, I'm going to define a struct that says, Hey, I've got fields, you know, X, Y, and Z, and, um, they're going to be in, uh, in long ints. 
Okay. Um, or I've got my position in WGA City 4 and my, uh, I've got a field called latitude, which is a double, longitude, which is a double, and, and altitude, which, you know, might be an integer. You know, again, these are structures that you come up with right here, these IDL types. All right. There are some primitive types that are back here, but these are like your really basic things, like, you know, the idea of it being a double. All right. Double and int and string and those kinds of things are all just you know defined back here in the shared data model we're not looking for you to come up with your own double right but you'll use you'll use the ones that are here in creating your structures and then finally over here there's these things called queries and templates now these you know are the things that go back to views so when i said you know, you're going to you know create a view <clears throat> and the, you know, the language looks an awful lot like, you know, uh, SQL, if you're familiar, okay? You know, well, that's the query side of this, okay? You're going you're gonna to use that to describe, hey, what data from the model is it that I'm including, uh, including in this payload, okay? So that's how you tie back to that model. Now, the template side of things is, well, now that I have this data, how do I want to organize it, okay? So... You know, you, the, the query, you know, theoretically goes back and gets this, you know, you know, flat, you know, flat view of the data. And you may want to have some other structure uh, around it so that it's organized and you can get maybe get a little bit of reuse in there too. So, for instance, if I'm trying to pull together, you know, data for, for my engines and my aircraft, you know, uh, I might have a query that says, so give me the data for the left engine and give me the data for the right engine. But my template says, okay, for each engine, I'm going to organize that into a structure. And I'm going to start out with all the temperatures and then I'm going to have all the pressures, all right? You know, that kind of stuff. But you can, you know, again, you're creating your data structures here for your messages. So, you know, that back to that brain picture, you know, back in that upper left hand corner where we're all comfortable, that's, you know, that's this stuff here. Okay. But the, you know, the right-hand side destination, you know, the picture, that's all the stuff up here. Okay. And then uh, this last piece, okay. Um, oh, by the way, you know, queries and things like that do exist at these other levels. But uh, like I said, I didn't show everything. I showed the, like, the, the important bits from each, the common ones. Um, but uh, anyway, uh, you know, if you do want to see what's really in there, you can take a look at the face standard or, you know, look at the uh, the meta model that's underneath everything. Um, and you'll see, you know, exactly what's there behind the scenes. Um, so finally, we've got this UOP model piece. And what do we have in there? Well, we've got, you know, platform specific components. We've got portable components. And for each of those, we can describe the connections, um, you know, you can think of a connection in this case as um, as a port um, to you know into or out of one of these. Okay, we use the term connection because that's what the transport services folks um, you know use. You know when you're using transport services, um, your code will call you know an API called create connection. Okay, and that's really you know what we're trying to to map to exactly here. So. Again, your component, you'll define some number of connections. Do they go in or out? What's the rate they go at? What's more importantly, you know, what's the data type that we communicate over? It? That's the kind of stuff you do at this level. Okay. Everybody with me? So the thing about doing this virtually is I can't see any kind of puzzled faces, so I can drill in a little further. So I'm relying on you guys. If you have questions, ask them. All right, I'm gonna go to the next chart. All right. Now, oh, yeah. Excuse me, Fred. I just wanted to give you a time um, check. Am I running out of time? <laughs> uh, no, not yet. <laughs> but uh, I just wanted to let you know it's 12, uh, 1214 right now. So when do we wrap up? 1230? Yes. Okay. Well, I'm getting there. Okay. Uh, sorry if I'm going a little slow. No, that's okay. I just wanted to let you know. So, um, so let's see. Somebody else, uh, earlier was asking about... Um, to Tony was asking about <clears throat> why not a more you know uh, relevant example. So here's one that's a little more relevant. Um, the word relevant was no pun intended, but um, you know when we're doing you know, when we're looking at a mission, there's a, there's this concept of a relevant operating picture, right? So we've tried to embody that here. 
We've got a relevant operating picture. That relevant operating picture is centered about a position. It has it has a size, right? It has some dimensions. It's this many, you know, uh, kilometers by this many kilometers and so forth. Okay. Um, that relevant operating picture may have you know, may be composed of, and that's the shorthand I'm using on this chart. Composed of zero to many tracks. Okay, a track is the thing that I'm is the thing that I'm tracking. All right. Those tracks might have an ID. They might have a kind. You know, maybe it's a ground track or an air track or whatever. All right. Conceptually, it doesn't matter. There, there's a kind that's interesting to me, and they have a position. Okay. So you know, here's a, again a really simple conceptual view on things. The logical level for my relevant operating picture, I've got an ID, and I'm going to use a UUID for it. Position, I'm going to do in WGS84. Measured with units, degrees, degrees, and meters, and I'm going to do the the size of it in in kilometers. And for those tracks, again, for my ID, I'm going to use use a UUID. Um, kind is an enumerated air, ground, sea. You know, I guess I could have subsurface and you know different kinds of things here. It's what you know. Again, it's up to you what you need. And for position, I'm going to use Earth centered, Earth fixed, and it's kilometers in all three axes. All right, that's at the logical level. Now at the platform level, okay, for my relevant operating picture, that ID, I'm going to use a string. I'm going to use doubles for the Latin long and int for the altitude. And for the size of the thing, I'm going to do that in floats. Now for my track, I'm also going to use a string for the ID. Uh, it's going to be an enum for the kind, all right, with these enumerations and position. It's going to be three doubles. And you've seen I've drawn these realizes line from one to the other just to show that, hey, this logical representation is the same as that. And this platform representation is the same as this logical one. It's just a, you know, it's a realization of it. Now, I'm trying to go quick because I you know, realize the time's running out. Um, so, you know, I've got two, two messages I want to communicate. All right, one that's got all of the tracks in it. Okay, and one that has information about the operating picture itself. So my tracks view says, hey, select all the tracks from relevant operating picture. Okay, so that's this list of things here. Okay, that's the data that I want in that view. Now, I haven't shown a template here, but I would then, you know, describe a structure that allows me to say, hey, you know, what does this look like? And for every track that's in there, you know, uh, how am I organizing that data? That would be in a template. Again, not in this example right now. Um, my relevant operator in picture view, I might say, hey, select a position and select the extents, but for extents, use the word size instead of extents, because most people realize what size means and extents isn't necessarily clear. So again, I can, you know, alias that here and uh, and select that from the relevant operating picture. Why is it in the room? Or a class? Um, <clears throat> Well, I mean, ultimately, I think the way we've got things mapped from IDL and NUMS into the different languages, I think a lot of them are wrapped in classes just to provide a namespace around them so they don't, there's not collisions. But, you know, um, for kind here, we just, you know, again, we just made a choice that, you know, these are the value, the, these are the enumerations you could take on. We didn't need any other kind of um, information, you know, uh, to accompany the, to accompany that, you know, I mean, struct I would normally think of as two or more pieces of data to represent it. And here you really only needed the one, that's the enumeration. Uh, let's see here. Let's see, that was a question from Sean, by the way. Um, so I'm gonna move on to make sure I save a little time for questions. Um, something I haven't talked about yet is the integration model. That was a phase 3 add-on. It's not required by everybody. And this is something an integrator you know, can choose to use, but it, it allows you to describe uh, how I'm going to connect units of portability together. So I may have you know, unit of portability X instance one and another you know, instance two. Okay, maybe I've got you know, two devices, you know, an, an EGI, you know, two EGIs on my aircraft for redundancy purposes. So I have two copies of this, and I'm going to map, you know, a message M out of each of them through a transport uh, node, and I'm going to transform it because UOPW doesn't speak the same language, right? The positions over here, you know, maybe are in um, in radians, and this guy needs degrees, 
So as an integrator, I'm gonna wire this up, I'm gonna move the data through the transport, I'm gonna transform the message type from what this guy gave me to what this guy needs, and it's gonna, path, gonna show up over here. And same thing, you know, this path, right? Because this guy says, well, I typically have multiple EGIs um, that I need input from because I'm gonna synthesize some kind of solution, you know, from redundant, you know, and, and pick the best based on redundancy. So he's got multiple inputs set up over here. Um, again, you know, similar example here, you know, I've got two different UOPs out there and this guy, this guy provides a subset of the data I need. This guy provides a different subset, maybe some things I don't need. All right, integrator is going to, you know, arrange to have that transported through whatever, you know, way he wants, whether he wants DDS or UDP sockets or shared memory or whatever, that's up to the integrator. And he uses an aggregator block to say, all right, take the pieces I need out of A, take the pieces I need out of BC, which is, looks like only C, create a message that this guy needs and pass it on to him. So this is, you know, again, this is a whirlwind, but this is the kind of stuff that would appear in an integration model. Again, it's optional. Not everybody has to use it. I mean, if you're just making UOPs, you wouldn't use this, you know, you wouldn't deliver this anyway. Maybe you would use it for your testing. But integrators, you know, can can choose to use it if it helps them. And even an integrator isn't required to use this. All right, I'm gonna move on. Um, so, all right, so now we're, we're, we're sort of through the language and the concepts and you know, now we're back to, you know, some of the, the, the big artifacts. Okay, so there's the phase 3.0 technical standards. Okay, inside it is this thing called the, the meta model. That's, the, you know, the meta model defines all the rules for the data model construction. It defines the fact that there are things called entities and there are things associations and there are things called characteristics and so forth. And, you know, an entity can have, you know, all the rules it says an entity can, you know, have composed into it some number of characteristics and so on. And there's also a set of rules that are added for different checks. Just like any programming languages, there's, there's a syntax. And then there's some semantic checks like, hey, the types have to be the same on both ends of this equal statement, you know, or assignment statement. Um, that's what, you know, these kinds of things are here for. Um, the meta model and the face standard is done using, um, we use the uh, Eclipse modeling framework and uh, and, a, and a, a tool in there called eCore, or well, a, a modeling feature called eCore, which is based on OMG's um, meta object facility. So what we have here, you know, again, is a is a MOF model, you know, uh, or a MOF model that forms the meta model for the face standard. Um, you know, if you're curious, you know, the uh, the MOF meta object facility is actually um, underpins UML as well. UML is defined, you know, using the MOF. Um, but anyway, so you know, so so it is a standard that we're we're based on top of. All right, and by using that, we automatically, um, through the use of that standard, get an underlying format for our data, which is called face XMI. So uh, the term XMI stands for XML for model interchange. Now, I know there's a number of modeling tools out there like EA and Cameo that produce, uh, you, know, you don't see my air quotes, but air quotes XMI, which isn't, you're really the same, it's not, it's not this, it's, their implementation of XMI is tool specific, where this is, you know, normative to the XMI standard established by OMG um, and is uh, established completely by the, the meta model using the meta object facility. So anyway, we've got our standard with a meta model inside it. We've got the shared data model with a governance plan behind it that, um, that describes how it's maintained over time and how it's changed. Um, let's see, and there's some details over here on, on that. I went through it a little bit earlier. We've got this thing called a domain specific data model, which is a, an optional thing, but, um, an organization or community of interest can define, you know, a bunch of modeling concepts that they use that are, that they then want used by everybody else. Um, so again, they can, you know, factor out some commonality and save, you know, save work across an organization by defining this thing. So this is just, uh, a set of things that might be used a little more broadly. When you're delivering your UO, UOP, you need to give a, a UOP supplied model, okay, which, you know, when it uses certain things, 
that are in the shared data model has to actually use the ones from the shared data model. So it must align with the SDM. And then again, there's the integration model, which we just talked about, which you know is built by integrators or maybe by UOP developers when they want to do a little testing. Um, you know, to tech, you know, to tie their new UOP into some test code and so forth. Um, but uh, again, it defines interconnectivity between UOPs. Um, let's see here some, you know, some of the ways that this, you know, might work. Okay, again, there are, there is no specific tooling, um, you know, mandated for face. I mean, you could use you know, your favorite UML editor with a profile, or you could use, you know, Emacs and edit the face XMI text file directly. Don't recommend that, um, but, you know, if you're that hardcore, go for it. But anyway, there's a, you know, a set of model editing tools over here. So this is, you know, Vanderbilt's GME, and this is Cameo, EA, Rhapsody has some stuff, and a, a number of companies developed their own proprietary tools uh, that I'm aware of. Um, these can, you know, take in the shared data model, uh, take in DSDMs and edit them. Same thing for UOP supplied models. And then there's a set of tools over here um, that, you know, folks can use. There's the face conformance test suite, which, you know, as the name implies, is used to get conformance, but also as part of that conformance process generates code from these models that you can, you know, you can use in your UOP. So all the data types for C, C++, Ada, Java, you know, all those kinds of things can be generated out of here from these models, the face transport services, APIs, um, you know, the API pieces of it, not the implementations can be generated out of here. Okay. And you can have your own tools that might do some things that are useful for you. Uh, how robust to be like a winning. Uh, how robust the available tools? Um, seems like not having a robust set of tools beyond compilers is a gap. Um, yeah, possibly. I mean, the set of, the conformance tools are, um, you know, they're they're gaining maturity. You know, they're a little challenging to use, but pretty much everybody seems to be using those for generating the code for the data model and the the, the APIs. Um, you know, there's been some profiles for some of these tools that are over here that are available to, you know, practically everybody. Um, there's a there's an EA plugin, there's Cameo plugins that are practically available to everybody. Um, you know, you, you could event, you could look at it as a gap, and you could look at it as an opportunity. I mean, you know, I worked well, I I worked at a prior company that did this, and I work at a current company that does this. Okay, and we feel like we've got something, you know, that's an advantage over these, um, you know, in terms of, you know, what the capabilities are and um, and uh, features for efficiency and so forth. So, um, so let's see, uh, Travis, I think the model editing tools need more work in general. Yeah, I, I can't say I disagree with that, Travis. Um, there's still room for improvement and it'd be nice to get some third party vendors on board, you know, doing some things. Um, that provide, you know, better, more mature, state-of-the-art capabilities. And that's, you know, one of the reasons that the FACE Consortium doesn't get into that business. We don't, you know, we don't want to be producing those tools. Um, time's getting critical here, so let's see here. I mean, I'm available past 1230 if we want to let it stay, uh, but I'll try to get through everything by then. Uh, so the FACE Conformance Test Suite, um, which is, you know, freely downloadable, um, is used to validate USMs and DSDMs. Okay, both must adhere to the published meta model and the standard, right? Meet all of the uh, OCL, object constraint language constraints that are in there. Okay, um, and uh, let's see here, they must adhere to the stuff in the shared data model. So if you're, you, know, you can't create your own measurement systems or observable types or ideal primitives, you have to use the ones from the shared data model. And if you need something that's not there, you need to file change paper to get it added so you, that you can uh, you can achieve conformance. Okay. Um, and uh, let's see, there's a set of query and template constraints, which at one point in time were in the um, governance plan, um, but in version 3.1 of the standard that's just been published, all this is in the 3.1 version of the standard now. Um, Let's see, the CTS, like I said, the, the automation process is validated and it generates, you know, code in each of the four target languages. Um, 
Let's see. There's a question about describing the data modeling from the two one edition. That's that's a long topic, so I don't think I'll have time for that here. Um, if you want to reach out to me separate, you know, I can. I think I've got a set of charts, but um, you know, I recommend everybody start moving with three three zero and three one. Um, let's see here. This is a plug for our reference implementation guide. Um, let's see. So, you know, there's this uh, the volume data architecture guide and the um, volume and the 3.0 uh, rig or the reference implementation guide for the 3.0 standard. Definitely recommend you take a look at it. And it is available in the Open Group Bookstore. Uh, let's see here. So, why are we here? Um, again, you know, data modeling is about describing the semantics, the concepts, the ideas, right? Underlying everything you're going to communicate. I mean, we've all picked up that ICD that we don't, we're not sure what they mean by the name of this piece of data. So that's what the data model is there to try to help with, right? To describe those semantics so that we got a better chance of understanding each other, all right? And better chance of understanding, you know, the data that goes into and out of our UOPs, you know, relative to things that we want to communicate about. Um, what's next? Let's see. Well, phase 3.0. So this is maybe an interesting thing. So phase 3.0 was published. And since then, all right, actually, it's, uh, it's not what is next. It's what's now. <laughs> um, we've, we've, ta we've taken parts of this standard and created a new standard called UDDL, Universal Domain Description Language. Okay. And you remember I said it can be used for anything. It's not domain. It's domain independent. All right, well, all those domain independent things that are not there specifically for face are in this standard. The ideas of entities and associations, observables, measurements, you know, types and queries, all those kinds of things are in this standard. All right, the remainder has been put into the face 3.1 standard. So face 3.1 actually references UDDL and adds a few things. And it adds things that face wants, you know, that are specific to face, like UOP models and templates for how you're organizing your data, the integration model and traceability, which we really haven't talked about. But all of these standards are now publicly available and published in the Open Group Bookstore. So, you know, really this is where folks, you know, probably should start spending their time is in the 3.1 UDDL 1.0 area. The data model really didn't change other than it got split apart. So the data model, you know, cumulatively here is exactly the same as it was here. Um, but anyway, let's see. All right. <laughs> Sorry, I didn't realize time was going by so fast. <clears throat> sure is fun when you're talking about data modeling. Anybody still out there? Any questions? No other questions, Bill. I did okay. judge the person's name that I'll send you that about the data modeling from the 2.1 edition. Okay. And send that to you. Okay, sounds good. I'll see if I can scare up that chart there. Um, there were significant changes. We had a lot of issues. The biggest change in 2.1, you know, to, from, from 3.0 to 2.1, or 2.1 to 3.0, is in the uh, the idea of the views. You know, that was changed substantially because what we had there, you know, just wasn't going to work very well. So that, that was the biggest area of change, standards-based measurements and things like that, a few other small things, but those are the, the big items. Uh, and thanks for the feedback there, um, Michael. Appreciate that. And Sean. And uh, like I said, I hope it was useful for everybody. And, um, you know, you'll see me in some of these virtual meetings. So, you know, if you've got any other questions or follow-ups, let me know. Um, the charts are posted on Plato. Um, let's see. Reggie, do you know exactly where that is? I mean, I have a copy on my local machine. And, uh, I don't know where um, Lauren has posted them yet, so, but... Um, people will get an email from her. All right. Well, thanks everybody for attending and Bill, thank you. Great job. No problem.